Good morning, everybody in the United States. Yeah, good afternoon in Europe and Asia, and good evening, uh, some of you folks as well, where it's uh, getting late, but I know many of you are dialed in across the world. And uh, thank you very much for reconvening for another HFS production. Um, today, we're talking about shaping the modern workforce. Uh, it's the right time to do that. Well, it really is the right time, and we're going to have a really, I think, humanizing debate about this today. Uh, my name's Phil First. I'm the CEO, Chief Analyst at HFS. I'm, I'm joined by uh, three terrific executives today, and I'm going to get them just to give them, give us a very quick introduction as well. So, so I'll start with you, Brad Keywell, the founder and CEO of Uptake. Hi, Phil. I mean, a, good, a little introduction of myself. Absolutely. So Uptake is a business in industrial intelligence. We're a SaaS uh, business delivering software to global industry uh, in manufacturing settings, energy fleets uh, of all sorts, both on highway and off highway, and a variety of other uh, equipment and machine related activities that correlate people, their activity to optimize productivity and reliability through predicted insight delivered to the front line of, of industry. So thanks for uh, having me. Looking forward to this. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Thank you for giving us the time. Uh, some Someone many of you will be familiar with, uh, Sandeep Dadlani. Over to you, Sandeep. Hi, Phil, and welcome to everybody. I hope uh, everyone who's dialed in is keeping safe and healthy during these uh, extraordinary times. So Mars is... Um, a large private uh, global family-owned company that is into multiple businesses, particularly into pet care, which is the largest business, which means pet food and vet hospitals and others, um, chocolates and confectionery, uh, human food, Uncle Ben's, call me your pasta, etc., and then personalized nutrition. And I am the chief digital officer at Mars. I'm uh, based in New Jersey, uh, and right now I feel at home. Good, and it's a very large home as well from what I gather. So great to have you on today, Sandy. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, a great friend of HFS. He's, he's uh, spoken at a couple of our summits in recent years and um, today joins us as one of our guests. So Ravi Kumar, welcome. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for that introduction. Hope all of you are staying safe and healthy. Very excited about this uh, opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, I'm the president at Infosys. Infosys is a global consulting and tech services company um, working for the global, global 2000 firms, partnering with them on digital journeys. Uh, in the times we are in, uh, we do hope that we could partner with large enterprises to keep them agile and resilient, as I call them, as I call it uh, for the times we are going to be in. And um, we hope we can uh, rethink work, workforce, and workplaces uh, for enterprises of the future. Excellent. Well, great to have you. Great to have you with us, Ravi. Look forward to hearing your contributions today. Um, so, without further ado, um, here are the instructions. Uh, there's a lot of you on the line, uh, so there, but there is an opportunity to pose some questions as we go along to the panelists and myself. Uh, so, pop them into the. Um, pop them into the panel on the, you can see it on the Q and A screen. I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with using Zoom at this point. So uh, there you have it. So feel free to get some questions again. We'll try and get to some of that. Um, we also have written a ton of research on this massive pivot uh, driven by COVID-19. We're calling it the paradigm shock and uh, feel free to go to our website uh, and you'll see on our homepage where to get all our research that we're actually making freely available right now to industry right across industry sectors to hopefully give you some insight as to what's happening what's going on and that sort of thing so um so looking forward to doing that wonderful so uh as winston churchill famously said never waste a good crisis i wouldn't say this is a good crisis especially with much of the unfortunate um, events that are happening across the world, but um, a crisis it is. And I think as you look back at maybe 2008 and what's happening today, I feel like we could have bailed ourselves out of anything except this. This was the one thing that created so much uncertainty across the world uh, that it's created a, you know, a real crisis that is 
uh, sapping the confidence out of many people. It's also inspiring others and creating, I think, uh, a disruption that we've never experienced in our lifetimes. You know, um, I personally think this is going to be around for 12 to 18 months. We just need to accept the fact that this is going to be around until we really do find a vaccine and get that distributed and a, hopefully some preventative medicines in the meantime and that sort of thing. There will be some loosening. There will be some um, reprisals. This thing is just, we just got to accept the fact this is here. This is reality. Um, it's not all bad. Um, I think it's also instilled some habits in us that are actually pretty good. And, um, and it's a humanizing experience for many of us as well, where I think we've come together uh, emotionally and socially with so many colleagues, families and friends um, in this in this time. So uh, while I think we're all struggling and suffering a bit with the restrictions on our lives, it's also, I think, created some good that's going to come out of this. Um, I also think there's some incredible opportunities for some. You know, this has created a whole new market space. Um, some will survive, some will struggle, some will pivot, some will hunker down. Some companies, they won't be able to uh, make that pivot. They might have too much legacy infrastructure behind them to do that. Some companies are just going to be down unlucky, wrong business, wrong time. Um, but at the end of the day, this is, this is business. Um, it's not life sometimes for some, and, and we, can, we can bounce back. There'll be a whole, whole new wave of, I think, digitally agile, data savvy, super energized businesses that don't rely on legacy. We, we're going to see a whole new suite of uh, things emerging from the from this crisis that um, I think some of it's pretty exciting it's going to create new opportunities for many new jobs that many people eventually or hopefully sooner than that and just a whole new way of doing things so two or three decades of, le of lethargy may be replaced in with two or three months of rapid action as we go through this but you know I, I truly believe we'll thrive again you know we can unleash passion creativity and energy and really avoid you know, wasting a real crisis. This is the crisis of our lifetimes. Um, we're looking at four phases. I call it a paradigm shock rather than a shift. This is a shock to the system. This is something that's happening fast and hard. And every week, every two weeks is a unraveling of the realization of where we are. And uh, we've come through our crisis phase. We've seen businesses figure out how to operate remotely get the right tech in place, stabilize those operations. Um, I think it's exposed a lot of what we can't do and what we can do. And, and, you know, you've just got to stay patient, develop contingencies. I think get cash and conserve cash. That's what you need in a crisis. And you need to basically plan. You know, if this is going to be a year, maybe even longer, we have to plan for that. We have to figure out how to survive, how to conserve money, maybe make some shrewd investments where you, where you want to, where you need to, maybe hire some new talent that came along that you maybe would not have got before this as well. So there's opportunities that are going to emerge from this. And then we're going to get into what I call the realization phase, which I think is kicking in already for some, but maybe not for everybody. But this is where we're seeing everyone truly place their bets. This is where you can truly visualize um, the real financial impact of what this is going to have on your industry, on your environment. Um, some areas are going to be increasing in volume. Some are going to be decreasing. Some will drop off completely. Your business, whatever you're in, is changing. Um, and some of it can change on an overall positive or maybe some on an overall negative. In certain instances, this just could just be the game of game ending and we need to go and do something else. This is business. We, we start another one. We, 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 we go again. This is... This is the reality of the situation we're in. And this is a pivot time. But in addition to realization, I talk about this is a time to unleash people. Uh, Ravi actually read a great blog where he causes look to do more and he'll, he'll build on that shortly. Um, but this is about a new playbook. This is about uh, a rule book that's never been written before. Um, there is no, let's just hunker down and wait for a V-shaped recovery and everything's gonna be the same as it was before, because it's not, and we know that. Um, there's gonna be some economic damage. We don't quite know how bad it's gonna be, but it could be pretty bad. Um, but this is a chance where we're bonded with our customers in a shared digital environment. This is where we have to accept that change is now a new constant. This is where we have to be driving 
new innovations and new ideas. This is, this really is a time for embracing our fear, driving our energy, driving our motivation. We talk a lot about the one office experience in HFS. This is about making the customer and the employee and your partners the centerpiece of your strategy where customers are, um, are supporting and you've got to anticipate the needs that are native to the entire organization. So you can't develop a customer experience without building in your employee experience and, and bring your customers and employees together with a common purpose and common outcomes, especially as we're all engaging in a, in a digital model for quite a long period of time. Eventually it won't be entirely digital, but it is right now. And we need to truly actually embrace this to have that experience across our whole value chain. It's more important than ever. And uh, engaging in this environment is, is really where things are shifting. And as we look at how we design that customer experience, that's really got to be human centric. You have to have it supported by this employee experience where we look at this sort of digital underbelly where you unify secure and cloudify your data automate your data we look at an intelligent support function where you can augment human capability you can really build out an inclusive mindset you can break down these stovepipes between departments and hr finance marketing it to really unify common outcomes and common goals and really think about principles, things like lean and design thinking are really being brought into play much more aggressively in this forced transformation that we're experiencing. So in addition to like automation and human augmentation, we also look at the insights that are necessary to make us smarter than our competitors, right? How can we anticipate the needs of our customers before everybody else and even before our customers may anticipate themselves? How can we be truly cognitive about this? How do we understand how to embrace technologies like machine learning, even if we're not an you know, algorithmic specialist? But how do we manage this from a business perspective so we know how this can enable our businesses? But ultimately, this is about designing a business where IT and business are partnered to achieve unified outcomes and engaging experience for our customers, our employees, and our partners. So I wanted to start off sort of today's conversation. Uh, one of my favorite writers at the moment, Simon Sinek, wrote a book called The Infinite Game. And if you get a chance to read it, I would definitely recommend it. But he says an infinite leader, an infinite minded leader uses their career to enhance the long term value of the company. And just some examples, um, a finite game is played by known players with fixed rules, whereas an infinite game is really played by known and unknown players. There's no exact and agreed upon rules. Um, the objective is to keep playing to perpetuate the game because there's no practical end to the game. There's no such thing as winning. It's about surviving. It's about having um, a true ethos, a, re a real raison d'etre for where you're going as a business. So game lives, game lives on and it's the players whose time runs out, right? Players exit when they run out of resources to keep playing. So in a finite model, it's all about being firm centric. In an infinite model, it's about being customer centric. Um, in a finite model, it's about understanding that customers change, but you prioritize and safeguard resources that you already built. But in an infinite model, it's about understanding that customer change, but changing with them and your business models with them. So looking at these mindsets, I thought I'd bring up some examples that are fairly familiar um, and looking at even strap lines of organizations. Remember Kodak, you know, they, they had a finite mindset. It was all about making photography as convenient as the pencil. That was really their end game. It was, but they couldn't flex their, their business model away from film. When their patents ran out, they filed for bankruptcy in 2014. And we all know what happened after that. Um, Fuji, on the other hand, had an infinite mindset where their whole raison d'etre was to help enhance the quality of life of people worldwide. They shifted the model away from film-based cameras. They went fully digital. They applied the technology to pharma, healthcare, cosmetics, semiconductors, and, and way more areas. Um, a very famous example, I'm not going to go fully into this one, but just so you can compare Blockbuster, they wanted to be the global leader in rentable home entertainment by providing outstanding service, selection, convenience and value. Whereas Netflix, they just wanted to entertain the world. They decoupled the acquisition of movies, they decoupled themselves, and they added adjacencies with content creation. 
Um, another great example, I think, is Lego. So in 2003, believe it or not, Lego nearly went out of business. You know, they considered the brick obsolete. They over diversified into jewelry, clothing, theme parks. They lost customer centricity. Then things shifted, right? They looked at an infinite mindset. They went, you know, we want to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow, right? They literally want to inspire people. They want to inspire children and their parents, right? So they realigned the customer, had lots of smart partnerships. They've engaged in lots of STEM solutions, media, movies, everything. They've created something infinite. And the, the other example I wanted to share with you today, um, Microsoft, right? Uh, five or six years ago, you know, they were still, you know, they were a pretty negative brand. It was, they had, you know, their support was poor. People were fed up with them. They weren't seen as innovative. You know, they just banked money, you know, and it was, it was a tough organization to, to work with. And what's happened, I mean, has been you know, a revolution. They brought in a new CEO, Nardella. He dug deep into the DNA of Microsoft and found innovation at its core. And he really brought it out. He brought in this mindset, this infinite mindset where, he would empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. His highest priority was renewing the company culture, fostering experimentation, and streamlining cross-functional teams. So I want to um, get into uh, today's um, uh, conversation around what's happening in the market. And we, we, did, we ran this survey this month, and thank you ever so much for many of you who participated, 631 businesses. And, and we had a good split of people who sell, buy, and advise technology and business services. Um, and the first thing we asked was um, business planning versus personal expectation. And you can see here on the business side, most enterprises are planning for two to three months, really, a few in the uh, longer periods, whereas people personally think this is going to be six to 12 really, you know, maybe a bit less than that. But those are the, those are the expectations of, of most folks here. So maybe um, it'd be good to hear from the audience, from the panelists today, to hear what they think is going on. So maybe Brad uh, from Uptake Technologies, would you like to give me your view? What's your personal expectation here? And, and, and is this aligned with your business planning? Uh, I, thanks, Bill. It's, um, like everyone else, it's, it's impossible for any certainty. And therefore, as a leader, my bias is to prepare, uh, not necessarily have a strong opinion about any one outcome. Uh, in terms of how we think at Uptake about um, going back to work, if you will, we couldn't be harder at work. I think that software organizations are fundamentally structured to thrive in remote settings uh, because we operate as a team of teams and each small team is able to strongly uh, act, build, collaborate, generate as a small unit. And then by having interconnectivity, almost an API type mentality internally at Uptake, we're able to asynchronously have great clarity of how we all connect and we have exponential gains. All of that being said, what we're, what we're equally focused on uh, in addition to our own activities and our, the health and, and, and uh, safety of our people and, and their families is our customers. And in terms of our orientation to our customers, in terms of enabling precision and predictive operations, uh, we see, uh, generally speaking, um, a, an emerging trend towards understanding the opportunity at hand versus just preparing to go back exactly as was. So as will be versus as was is an orientation that is beginning to be clear with every week, really. Every week feels like a month. Um, but with every week, this um, we must be thinking, this is our customers speaking, um, we must be thinking. Our leaders have asked us to think about what will be and because of that, upskilling our people, as um, uh, as as we spoke, as Robbie and I spoke about when we were in Davos, upskilling our people, and enabling or enhancing our operations with actionable real-time insight-based technology versus process-based technology, we are hearing that loud and clear. 
So in the midst of this crisis, we actually are starting to see a, an early signs of momentum in terms of more decisive than ever, digital enablement, digital equipping, digital, if you will, transformation activity that I know Sandeep um, at Mars feels strongly about as well. This is, this is where things are heading and this is an interestingly opportune time uh, to act on where things are going. So, well, I think you queued up uh, Sandy very well there. Um, for your view, um, I know we had a chat about this about two, week, two, three weeks ago, Sandy. But has your view changed at all in that time? And um, what are you, what are you thinking in terms of timescales and impact? And you know, how does a, you know a global organization like Mars and, and you personally address this? So for at Mars, uh, the first 10 priorities through this entire period has been uh, the safety and well-being of our associates. Um, and we mean well-being because each one of us, arguably on this call as well, has a personal situation um, going on, either with friends, family, or an emotional situation, or a moment of panic or anxiety uh, that only you can uh, know and experience as you have. And we are worried about that. We, we really care about how our associates are experiencing their own situation. Now, if you move ahead from that, we've divided our plans into three phases, largely. So it correlates well with your four phases. The first four weeks is how we simply responded to the shock the next 18 months, and yeah, we, I mean, we've created a scenario for 18 months, just like you have, is an uncertain recovery. And then post that, we are talking about uh, what we call as a next normal. Uh, and that's how we're thinking about it. And there are various scenarios within these phases, as we have talked about. One thing is very, very clear. Everything we hoped for in digital to go 100 times faster just happened right now. Anything that could go online has gone online. Another thing that's become clear is that our purpose as a business, for example, the pet care business is a better world for pets um, or our Mars Inc purpose to create a better tomorrow. It remains very relevant. And this is gonna be a test for a lot of businesses. Uh, it's a leadership moment, we believe. It will separate those that uh, are sincere about their purpose. Simon Sinek is a friend of Mars and has helped us with our purpose uh, statements as well. Um, and so those who really were sincere, authentic of being a responsible business uh, are gonna be, are gonna stand out, I feel, in this, uh, in this crisis. Um, obviously a lot of progress on digital. Uh, everything that we dreamt of in the last few years has happened in the last few weeks and more is happening now. Um, but I would emphasize that we are worried about how might we keep going with the empathy, the purpose, the leadership, the trust we are developing now, the authenticity we are developing now, even post-crisis. And that's a super priority for us. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, so in terms of the magnitude of this it's obviously easy to look back in hindsight with these things but um you know 80 percent of both enterprises and and service providers feel that this is going to be bigger than what we experienced in 2008 and everyone experience, expects to see some impact on sales example but um ravi kumar do you do you concur with that view do you think this is going to be a more seismic impact on on our industry and, and in the industry in general than we experienced 12 years ago? So, uh, so Phil, uh, thank you for that question. I think uh, Brad and Sandeep have covered, uh, covered uh, quite a bit about what organizations are going, going through. Uh, I would say um, there are industries which are going to benefit out of this. Uh, the ones which are adopting digitization of their landscapes in a big way and uh, as Sandeep rightly pointed out the many which were looking for a shock you know I, I, I hope it wasn't a shock like this but they had to actually get a shock to absorb that faster 
So uh, digitization in many ways has switched and accelerated. Um, I would think there is also a shift of digital dollars to workplaces and employee and talent value chains. A lot of digital dollars were spent on consumer and supplier value chains. And I think it's kind of switched to uh, employer and talent value chains. Um, organizations of the past, um, when they transformed, you know, I call this the equilibrium, like Sandeep mentioned the new, no the new normal. Um, you know, you go back to history, equilibriums were always disrupted uh, in short bur bursts of disruption. And in some sense, it's called the punctuated equilibrium. And the ones which were agile um, through long periods of stability and equilibrium actually survived to the next wave. Um, this specific uh, crisis is testing us not just on agility, but also on resilience. So organizations of the future are gonna be tested on agility and resilience. Um, as we go forward into the, into the fourth phase, I call, this, I call this looking for more, you're gonna be tested on whether organizations have the resilience to deal with a future unknown unknown. Remember the, the, the crisis today is a known unknown. Organizations are going to prepare themselves for an unknown unknown in anticipation that something is going to come in and they don't know what it is. So they're going to build resilience on demand or virtualization on demand. Uh, the traditional theories of, uh, you know, make to order just in time, asset efficiencies, which give valuations to enterprises will change significantly. Um, Coming back to service providers like us, um, we're going to go through a very different paradigm. Um, we're going to redefine work, workplaces, and workforce. Uh, I would think um, work will get disconnected from jobs. Work is a bunch of tasks. Jobs, as all of us know, is a job. Work will get disconnected from jobs jobs and work are going to get disconnected from companies which are increasingly going to become platforms. Um, and this is the reality. We're going to rethink workforce, workplaces, and work. Work is going to progressively move from humans to humans plus machines. And we have to start thinking about how do you collaborate with machines? Workplaces are going to go virtual but they will swing between virtual and physical, physical and virtual in the next 12 months because there isn't a vaccine. And as you get to the new equilibrium, you're gonna find yourself in a completely new hybrid model. Workforces for the first time will start revisiting um, whether the gig economy is gonna play an important role in enterprises. Um, till now, gig economy was focused to uh, sharing you know, sharing apps and uh, ride sharing, uh, ride sharing in a, in, in, a, in a generic way, but enterprises are going to actually absorb much more gig economy. Today, the average percentage of gig economy in the market is between 10 to 12 percent. It's that's probably going to go significantly higher because you can actually break packets of work into small bursts and allow organizations to absorb it. So there is quite a bit of change which is going to happen, and I think service providers and uh, enterprises, uh, if they can cope up with this change and redefine uh, the future, uh, they're, they're, going to, they're going to emerge stronger. Some would emerge stronger and some would go weaker. Yeah, um, and uh, I hate to put you on the spot, Ravi, but one of your um, peers, in one of your competitors came out, I think yesterday and said that, um, you know, we're operating a 20 year old business model and as we evolve from this, only 25% of the original delivery centers are going to maintain people. Um, I personally don't know how that works when you have a model built on educating young kids coming out of college and stuff. But uh, do you agree with this or do you think um, something else is going to emerge, particularly in the IT, IT services space? So 
So Phil, you know, it's anybody's guess on those numbers, uh, but I would say the model will certainly evolve. Um, it will evolve um, to a more efficient and a more outcome-based model. Uh, Sandeep mentioned about uh, empathy, and I actually think, um, you know, I'm seeing more of it now than ever before. There is a lot of gratitude to what we do. Uh, Agile distributed is getting revisited. In fact, I was actually talking to a client CIO last week, uh, and we were reviewing the productivity metrics between um, our teams. Uh, and they're a very big client of ours. And we're running a survey internally to find out whether our hypothesis is right. We think productivity has shot up. And in the new equilibrium, when you have hybrid, um, a hybrid model, I would think productivity will, uh, it'll be a good, good idea to measure it. The reason why productivity will shoot up is um, there is a lot more sense of empathy. Uh, we're talking about an hybrid model. What way we are today in a shutdown, in a complete shutdown situation, uh, we are uh, not as in as efficient, but in a hybrid situation, we're going to be much more efficient. Um, lesser com com commute times. Uh, there is a Chinese developer who, who said this, we are going to go from 995 to 007, um, which is nine, nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock in the evening, five days a week to 007. Um, there is going to be a lot more spurts of work and we all know that productivity in an office is not more than four to five hours in an eight hour schedule. And I've seen this now that uh, there are developers who are actually dropping code on production at two in the morning, three in the morning, which did not happen before. And that's because they are kind of um, blurring their personal and professional lives and taking work in spurts. And that's the reason why I think the gig economy will play a good role. Um, they're harnessing the power of technology much more than before. Um, uh, however, as you said, we need to think about culture. Culture is always driven by uh, workplaces. How will that evolve and how will that play an important role? How would you build a sense of community? What's, what's, how would you work in cross-functional teams? How would you build office-based flows and rhythms, the nuts and bolts of working as the call it? Um, how are you going to measure outcomes versus effort spent. And that's a, that's a big shift we are going to go through. Um, I know I call this the productivity optimism. I, I wrote a post last week about the productivity optimism. There are, there are some, you know, there's, a, there, there's an employee in my team who came back and decided, look, I feel much more, I have much more gratitude to the fact that I have this job and I'm, I'm going to put my heart into it. So people are seeing this in a, in a very different way. Um, so I would say, the, the evolving 20 year model will certainly change. Uh, it will go into a hybrid. Uh, we have full-time equivalent workforce in, in, our, in our organizations. It will go from full-time equivalent to uh, humans plus gig. Uh, I would arguably say it's humans plus gig plus machines. Um, and, um, and productivity will be back in the, back in the middle. Um, on how you're going to how you're going to measure your teams because you don't see them. Sandeep mentioned about trust. I think it's a very important aspect. Today we are trusting our employees much more than before. Remember, this is working out of homes. They have access to data. How do we deal with it from a security perspective? That's going to be very critical, and that is going to be very critical to move mission critical work uh, to uh, to homes. Um, and um, we are going to swing between physical to physical, physical to virtual, virtual to virtual, and that continuum um, is uh, going to continuously evolve. Uh, so very interesting times. It's, it's a great opportunity to, um, to, to evaluate what you just said about um, phase two and phase three. Evaluate every, every aspect of what I spoke about and see uh, what's the right calibrated model for virtual plus physical as we go forward. Hey, Robbie, it's, it's Brad. I, I'd add one thing to, or two things to what you're saying. Um, more than ever, uh, what we see, we're, we collaborate with you, with Infosys, many other firms in terms of delivering software to the front lines. Uh, I'm seeing CIOs, CTOs, and chief digital officers like, uh, like Sandeep, more than ever, capable and asked uh, 
to deliver outcomes of impact to CFOs and to COOs. Um, the idea that technology can not just, of course, improve process, which has been the core of enterprise technology for decades, but now technologists can affect operational outcomes. So OT versus IT. And the idea of optimized precision of activity, and not just optimized process, has massive financial benefit. But it's hard to insert that opportunity into um, a business that's, that's churning along. Uh, and so the idea that it's working, everything has always been this way, you know, it's on our list, but not a priority, which was the case, versus we have a pause. We have an opportunity to deploy capital. Um, are we going to do it in the old way to keep the lights on and sort of keep things going? Or are we going to allocate some of that capital to specifically better outcomes? And have an outcome driven expectation from technology versus a just keep things okay driven expectation. Um, that collaboration between um, a, a leader of technology, again, CIO, CTO, CDO, and the overall leader of an enterprise with outcome driven financial accountability, a CFO, a CEO even, um, uh, is really opportune. And I'll just offer one example. You mentioned, uh, I know Sandeep and I have, have spent time on this, and, and Ravi, you mentioned that machines are part of this conversation. It's not just people and, and sort of um, process, but it's how we impact people plus technology, how we impact how machines produce output. And the more precision we are in relationship to how we interact with the machines that make things, that deliver things, you know, be it a, a, a fleet of trucks, be it a, a factory or some distribution center or supply chain activity, the more precision focused we are and the less process focused we are, we use less parts because we're maintaining and optimizing those machines with better clarity. Well, less parts means greater free, free cash flow. And all of a sudden, we can be more intentional in how we deploy people in relationship to machines and uh, productivity. Now, all of a sudden, we're not just getting more throughput off of the same machines. We're doing more with the same. And we're not just having a more, uh, more dexterity, more capability of our, uh, of our workforce because we're augmenting them with, with the advantages of, of real-time insight but we're also optimizing the parts and the outside use of resources in relationship to those machines and that activity. So we're freeing up cash. I mean, this has a major, major effect, not just on internal operations, but on the company's balance sheet and on a company's cash flow statement. And I think that the ability for technology leaders to be a material player impacting positive changes in a company's balance sheet and cash flow statement is a big deal. And it's not necessarily, or it hasn't necessarily been um, championed to date. Uh, it's starting uh, clearer than ever. And it's really, I think, going to be a headline going forward, how important a business-minded technology leader is because of things like parts and supplies and, uh, and, and, and the ability to make sure you're doing the right thing proactively and predictably. You're spot on, uh, Brad. Thank you so much for for those comments. Yeah, and um, I, I pulled up some data here where we asked the enterprises and where they were looking to make some increases in investment as a result of the current crisis. Now, bear in mind, this is a month into this, and I think people aren't looking to decrease some of these investments at this point um, and whether they can actually make these investments in this environment is, a, is also questionable. But obviously cybersecurity is up the top. Um, automation um, is, is also um, looks to be on the increase, particularly as you move work into these distributed models. I also pulled out things like AI um, is being looked at quite aggressively and even 5G, people look at remote 
work environments. I think we need a much better mobile infrastructure and maybe some areas like blockchain right now might be slightly less on the front burner um, as we look at what's immediate and what's needed. Maybe um, Sandeep, uh, I know you're, you're a keen investor and thinker around automation and AI in particular. I mean, do you think you're going to be increasing investments in these areas as well? Or do you, you know, what type of technologies do you think you'll be really looking at over the next few months? Yeah. So first of all, we are fortunate in Mars to be in a company that even during this crisis and perhaps the recovery, um, we have products and services that consumers want. Um, and, and so we are still in demand and, and very relevant and perhaps some parts of the business growing faster than usual. Uh, and we've always invested for the long term. Um, so technology and digital investments uh, now become even more relevant, although much more sharply prioritized, as you can imagine. So if I look at this chart, you know, we've always been heavy on our cloud and cybersecurity investments. And so those remain the same for us, to be honest, because we've really invested well in them and and, and so far we've pivoted well to these times to be extra vigilant on cybersecurity uh, with partners like the ones in the panel and, and as well as cloud partners that have helped us uh, dramatically in this time. Where I'm excited about most is the use of analytics and AI in the enterprise just went up like a thousand percent in the last six weeks. It's not that we did not have the capabilities but pilots that showed visibility into consumer trends, our social listening teams that use a lot of AI have gone into overdrive, just understanding micro trends. Let me give you an example. I mean, it's okay for a cosmetics company to say, well, it's a bad time for cosmetics. But if you go deeper and listen deeply, in-home hair color is shot up through the roof for obvious reasons. Uh, facial makeup or some kinds of facial ma makeup if you had put the video on, you would have realized that it's actually going to go up in, in this uh, time. So there are micro trends that are emerging. Grocery online used to be 6% of America. It just went up to 15%. That was supposed to happen three years later. It just happened in four weeks. That changes everything. Instacart decides what item on my order will get substituted with what. That is massive power. So there are micro trends there, which analytics is helping us with in supply visibility into where my raw material is, where my inventory is, what my production planner is thinking and where the demand is, where the infection is going to hit next. Even the death doubling rates that we are now numbed to because of the constant bombardment on TV become an important metric in how you plan your supply chain for the future. The competitive dynamics have changed. Frankly, a lot of startups and insurgents that were pegging away at a lot of share of have in general, in many categories, lost share uh, because, you know, people in crisis go back to trusted brands and global brands have better, you know, more resilient supply chains as of now. The channel dynamics has, have changed, as you can imagine, huge concentration in the consumer industry with, you know, the Tesco's, the Walmart's, the Amazon's. Uh, and now the Instacarts, the Ocados, the ship it, ships, et cetera. And then finally, the most important thing, which I think we will invest in, is the clock speed of the company. You see, large global companies had a clock speed that was you know, yearly, maybe quarterly for some, and so on. Well, the uncertain recovery phase in the next normal means that companies will have to work weekly perhaps daily. There have been more agile stand-up calls with non-technology executives in the last six weeks than ever before. That shows that a new speed of corporations is coming. An example of that is the you know, oft-abused augmented virtual reality line you have here. We had a, an augmented reality pilot at one of our factories that was supposed to help a remote worker help a production line worker make a production line change among other maintenance activities. That pilot was glorious, was perhaps only in one factory, um, celebrated over email. In the last four weeks, it just went viral to dozens of factories because it's badly needed right now. Who would have thought? 
that augmented reality would go viral like this. So plenty of investment areas. I'm most excited about analytics and automation because this is the time for all those uh, RPA and AI engineers, intelligent automation engineers, the analytics data scientists who anyways didn't shave, uh, who are sitting at home and who are pl plotting their data points very well. This is the time for them to shine. The data scientist is now in the center of the boardroom more than ever before. Yes, Sandeep, if I may ask you, uh, or maybe this is for Phil as well, um, um, do you see workplace technologies um, more digital for employee value chains? In fact, one of, one of my clients last week mentioned to me that their talent chain, value chain, has moved from attract, develop, retain to access, curate, and engage. The collaborative technologies, which in some sense today are very fragmented, uh, how they're going to come come in a very integrated way into the workplace. Do you see those those coming into picture? And uh, I wanted to also talk, ask uh, Brad if um, if autonomous technologies and um, uh, and um, um, contactless technologies, as they call it, um, that comes into picture. Uh, I was talking to utility clients uh, last week, and they told me field service and smart grids will play an important role for them. So there are there are other aspects of uh, digitization which never happened before, which are kind of now coming to the, coming to the front. I, I agree with you. I think, look, uh, uh, we all got a fast primer on Teams and Zoom, et cetera. But now you see other pieces of technology that are gonna become super important for, for experience as much as productivity. Um, so now uh, all the teams guys are complaining about how much whiteboarding they can do on whiteboard and can they you know, supplement it with other pieces of equipment and tools. There is more use of even Tableau Power BI uh, as a workplace technology because you know, people don't now want to, people want to, use, to develop their own visualizations in the comfort of their, in their home offices uh, on data that, that had ever before. And then for the offices, for example, China that has returned back to the workplace in a partial way. The idea, and when we look at them now through our Zoom screens and team screens, uh, of all of them wearing masks, of all of them being uh, far away from each other, um, socially distancing themselves, getting temperature checks all the time, our factories have that and so on, is a unique environment. And the more technology can help humanize that environment, the better. Otherwise it looks like a dreaded you know, workplace to go back to in, in many ways. So, so I would imagine technology will be a huge immersion in the workplace at home and in the workplace, but as much to humanize it than to just improve productivity. And the yeah. employee experience part. I, I'd add to that. Um, it's interesting, Ravi, you mentioned the, the world of utilities uptakes products are leaders uh, in not just optimizing field service in utility activities like the grid uh, and optimizing grid uh, effectiveness and reliability also in wind turbines in solar arrays um, so our products are in market distributed and uh, installed and and, uh, and, uh, and being used by some of the leading utilities in, in the United States um, and actually outside the United States as well, the capability of, uh, of, of, of insight that is fortified, that's enriched by data coming off of the grid, off of wind turbines, off of, uh, off of assets themselves. So the assets are generating data and let's say for a number of years, we've talked about the ability of that data uh, activated, uh, I'm sorry, the asset activated data to help people be better. That has been true. It just hasn't been acted on uh, as actively as it could. What is happening now because we are all remote and because sending a team of people out to an asset requires more thought than ever. Um, now we're saying, does that team of people really need to um, get in a, a, a truck and go to the and go to that asset 
And if they do, are they taking the right parts? Are they gonna do the exact right thing? And are they going to increase and optimize the productivity and reliability and output of that industrial or production related activity? That is where technology meets people, meets operations in a way that objectively and certainly creates outcomes, better outcomes, more profit, more uh, revenue, all of these things are finally being embraced. They've been available. Companies like Uptake have been in market growing radically. Uh, you know, so I'm not complaining about our growth. I am stating that the clarity of the outcomes that are realized when you plug Uptake in uh, have been clear for a while. But now that digital leader, that um, IT leader is realizing that OT, operational technology, is worth it. It's worth focusing on being great, not just at IT, but on OT and with operational technology enhancement and equipping all of your people with the insight, the, the digitally provided insight of how to be excellent at what they do. Now we can really be of service to the entire company and we can deploy people in a precise way to create better outcomes. So. Um, I know that Sandeep has, that this is one of his, one of your Sandeep's main activities, which is deploying technology for the Mars enterprise to be its absolute best and for the people within Mars to be their best. Um, but to your point, Ravi, uh, companies like Infosys that collaborate with Uptake to put this technology in market and deploy it throughout an entire organization's array of activity, machines, and frontline facing people, the capability of deploying predictive optimization technology to the front lines is more certainly worth it than really any other technology spend in my opinion right now, because we can actually create better outcomes by finally getting over the hump of, um, well, could we do it? And, and getting into the world of let's do it because we know it's the most productive, profitable way for us to invest money right now. Absolutely, Brad. In fact, uh, Phil, I had a, uh, the, you know, these are terrific comments, Brad. Thank you so much. I had a question for you, uh, which is about, um, do you see this as an inflection point for pricing input and output both uh, on outcomes, which means um, like how the gig economy works, you price the talent um, output, the talent input, on, a, on an outcome and you price your output to clients on an outcome. I don't know whether that's going to switch, but uh, I certainly see the, the fixed capacity of large enterprises um, kind of going down and the, and the variable capacity with gig going up um, or the contingent workforce as they call it. And with uh, outcome based input and output, it could be a, it could be a terrific inflection point. Yes. I, I think we are, seeing a huge pivot in how we get work done and how we access talent and labor. And um, right now, companies across the world are looking to how do we source talent in machine learning, robotics, all these different areas. Um, I share some data. We did a huge study across 600 plus businesses with KPMG last year and uh, looked at all the elements of intelligent automation tech, everything from analytics to RPA, cognitive. And our concern when this um, crisis hit was no one's done enough. Everyone is just like 15% in with some scale up with any of these techs, right? And then suddenly, wow, we really do need to uh, have, a, have a strong look at how we do things better. So just moving basic workplace processes into a work at home model actually exposes workflows that may have not been touched for 20, 30 years and all of a sudden it's, oh, hang on a sec. Maybe if we tried to do it this way, we introduced this and we made this process chain work right from customer to employee in this way, we can run this better. So simple force transformation like that is forcing a shift in logic at the client end on just looking at a different way of doing things to stay in the game. So get your supply chain working, make sure you're getting the right things at the right time in the right way. You know, just, just stabilizing your business 
is making you absolutely look at what do we need to get this done. And this is now forcing us to stop looking at shiny new bells and whistles um, with technology and look at what exactly do we need to help us function in this in this in this environment. And there's almost a desperation from some organisations to get where they are much much faster. Like I've spent time talking with. C-level executives on how the hell do we sell complex solutions or adopt complex solutions over video conference rather than a physical environment. You can do it, but it just requires a big shift. And so we are going through a complete game changer in how we do business and how we operate and how we staff projects and how we get talent and volume. I mean, what we're seeing as CEOs today is the volumes of your businesses are shifting massively. So in certain areas, volumes are way up. In other areas, they're way down. In some areas, they're off to completely gone. And so you're shifting your business dramatically to service those volumes. And then how you pay for that, I think is like open game at this point. And I, I, I actually think this is the first time in many, many, or probably the first time ever that a lot of enterprises are looking at this and thinking like, I will pay to get this done in the way I need it. And I'm, I'm more concerned about the outcome than just getting a lights on basic service. So I absolutely think in areas that are adding true value, um, we are gonna see a much bigger shift towards an outcome based model uh, than we've ever seen before. Um, and I definitely am already hearing about some conversations that are in, in, in flow that are making this change, but there's no written rule book now for how this progresses. This is much more about experience. This is about get this done. This is about how do I get services delivered? How do I automate this more effectively? And, you know, if someone can do it for you and they want to be compensated in this way, I think customers are going to embrace that. They're going to be like, how can we make you really get this effective for us? I don't want to wait six months for this damn thing to work. I want this working in six weeks. How can I incentivize you to do that? And I think Speed is going to drive a big change in, in, in outcomes. And technology firms are going to get rewarded on speed, ability to pivot, scale, and give customers what they want because right now this is critical. Bill, I, I, told, this is, I totally agree. Taking friction out of the implementation, deployment, and, uh, and outcome creation process, the less friction, the more success, which is why SaaS is, the whole SaaS movement is built for where we are right now and where we are, we'll be, where we'll, we'll, we're going to be going uh, as we move, we move forward. Thank you very much. So I think, um, I mean, this has been the fastest hour I've experienced in the last few weeks, but uh, I'd like to, I think there's a lot of people on the line still. So I'd like to finish up with a piece of data and I want everybody's takeaway perspective on this, which is um, when we spoke to the actual sell side, um, close to four fifths of them are seeing their clients looking at designing completely new ways of operating in this environment to get ahead of their competition. There is a new rule book being developed. Everything is getting turned on its head. So maybe I could go through each of you guys in turn with, you know, what's the one big takeaway from this conversation that you think is going to happen in the next maybe six months that's going to truly change this industry and maybe we'll start with you Ravi Kumar what's the one thing that are you you're going to see happen that is driving companies to completely change how they're running themselves so I would say uh, Phil um, you're going to go you know well, I spoke about work workplaces and workforce all three of them would change to a new normal. Work is going to go from humans to humans plus machines plus gig. Um, workplaces are going to go physical plus virtual with more embrace of technologies. And, um, and I would say workforce will completely go from a 100% uh, full-time equivalent kind of uh, setup to a more distributed um, model of um, accessing people who are available to deliver for outcomes. So these are these are the big shifts we're going to see in um, uh, in enterprises. Thank you, um, Brad Keywell. What's the one thing that you think is going to really change our whole way of operating in this environment in the next six months? Uh, Phil, I, I think that the org chart itself, 
corporate org chart will be reconsidered based upon the clarity that will come from these asynchronous distributed operations that we're now in. Uh, and it will be rethought in order to optimize exactly what we've been talking about for the last hour. Who is accountable for not just the, ma the maintenance of technology, but the deployment of technology to make everything better? Is that a, is that a COO? Is that a divisional uh, uh, leader, general manager? Or might there be a new branch uh, uh, in an org chart that deals with technology in service of better outcomes across the board? So technology is profit maker, uh, business value uh, expander through more revenue and more profit, more efficiency related to technology. Um, I think that's going to demand the, a rethinking subtly but importantly, of how we think about org charts and uh, profit and loss responsibility. Thank you, Brad. And um, Sandeep Adlani, um, one thing that you think is going to really change the whole operating model in the next six months that you think is going to be most pronounced? It's got to be speed of how organizations work. Uh, the clock speed um, we are trying to drive our omni-channel and D2C initiatives at a very different speed today. Um, the data science piece is coming across even faster than it ever. I almost said data is a new oil and then I paused. I said, no, I can't say that anymore. But, yeah, yeah. I, but the whole uh, speed of an organization uh, has fundamentally changed and will continue to change. And for any digital change executive out there, I mean, this is open season. For the next 18 months, you will be able to drive more change in your enterprise than you ever have in the last 10 years. And who knows after 18 months what. So the speed of change is, uh, is now on sale, literally. Uh, and, it, and, you know, it's, it's our time to pick up the opportunity. You started with Winston Churchill saying, never waste a good crisis. I'll end with Charles Dickens saying, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. So take advantage of the best of times. <laughs> hey, Sandy, I've got a better one for you. Data is the new toilet paper. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's absolutely fantastic uh, conversation, chaps. And I'm going to have a copy of these slides available on, on our website, hfsresearch.com. We'll, we'll share them with everybody who signed up for this as well, spent their time uh, with us today. Really appreciate this. Um, a humanizing conversation and this could have gone on for another two or three hours but um, I think we had some great insights and Brad Brad that was fantastic from you and hearing more about what you do at Uptake Sandeep always a pleasure to have you come on and, and share your views I know it's hard with a lot of guys in your roles to be public with what is going on but I think everyone appreciates you making the time and Ravi Kumar great to read your recent blogs I think um Go on LinkedIn. Ravi's been writing some good stuff. And thank you for sharing your views with us today. And uh, let's all do this again at some time. I really appreciate it. Have a great uh, rest of week and weekend, everybody. And, and let's just stay with the course and, um, you know, be positive about change and what's happening in the world.